It's Hispanic Heritage Month. I'm your guest host, Camila Swanson, an intern on Big Eyes Insights team. And I'm Jorge Sedano, also an Insights intern. Coming up on this episode of In Clear Focus. American parents don't really care as much about their kids. They send their kids off to college at 18 and they just don't talk to them for a while. I think they're not as close as Hispanics typically are. Hispanics would hold their kids at their house until they're like in their late 20s if they really wanted to. You're listening to In Clear Focus, fresh perspectives on the business of advertising produced weekly by Big Eye. A full service, audience focused creative agency. Big Eye is based in Orlando, Florida, serving clients across the United States and beyond. Thank you for joining us. The Hispanic population is the second largest minority consumer group in the U.S. and one of the fastest growing, accounting for 57% of the population growth over the past two decades. There are over 63.6 million of us. Last year, Hispanic consumers had a combined buying power of $1.9 trillion and will contribute disproportionately to the growth in consumer spending over the next five years, when Hispanics are set to become 21% of this country's population. I belong to the youngest generation, Gen Z, born between 1996 and 2015, and nearly a quarter of my cohort, 23%, identify as Hispanic. And I'm a millennial, or Gen Y born between 1980 and 1995, and over a fifth of my generation is Hispanic. In this episode of In Clear Focus, we're going to take a look at some of the differences between Hispanic cultures, values, and levels of acculturation and what they mean for marketers. One thing that's challenging about marketing to Hispanic consumers is that we come from a variety of backgrounds. Our parents or grandparents might have come to the U.S. from Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and many other Spanish-speaking countries. The dialects, cultures, behaviors, beliefs, interests vary, perhaps more than non-Hispanic people might think. The syndicated research firm Claritas has a framework called Hispanicity, which measures the degree to which people of Hispanic heritage in the U.S. retain elements of their culture while acquiring elements of the American culture. Claritas uses various characteristics to segment consumers into one of five categories— These lie on a continuum from complete adoption of mainstream society's values and beliefs to the retention of values and beliefs from an immigrant's original culture. Claritas's HA1 is Americanizado and reflects 17% of Hispanic consumers. These folks were born in the U.S., speak English predominantly, are likely to be third generation, and follow few, if any, Hispanic cultural practices. Hispanicity category HA2 is Nueva Latina and reflects 29% of Hispanic consumers. They were born in the U.S., prefer to speak English, and are likely to be second generation, following some Hispanic cultural practices. This classifies me, I think. Category HA3 is Amicultural, and reflects 26% of Hispanic consumers. They immigrated to the U.S. as children or young adults and are bilingual, following many Hispanic cultural practices. I believe this category best classifies me. Category HA4 is Ipano, and reflects 15% of Hispanic consumers. They immigrated to the U.S. as adults, and although they have been here 10 or more years, prefer to speak Spanish. They predominantly follow Hispanic cultural practices. And finally, HA5 is Latinoamericana, and reflects 13% of Hispanic consumers. They immigrated to the U.S. as adults less than 10 years ago, and Spanish language predominates. They follow Hispanic cultural practices and identify more with their home country than the U.S., In their 2021 Hispanic Market Report, Claritas highlights some of the differences that exist between Hispanic consumers based on their country of origin, annual household incomes, and language use. These differences are reflected across a wide variety of consumer behaviors, from the use of internet and streaming services, to insurance, e-commerce, and traditional in-store shopping. For this podcast, we want to understand how these and other categories play out in real people's lives. So we asked some folks we know about their lives and consumption behaviors, starting with each other. How in touch are you with your Hispanic roots, would you say? I actually am very in touch with my Hispanic roots. I was born in Mexico and I immigrated here in the first grade, I believe. I was also raised in a border city, which meant I was able to be raised both in the U.S. and Mexico. So I was able to take in both of those cultures and still keep in touch with my family and all those things that influences all my behaviors and all my purchases or anything that I do to this day. 
So Camila, how in touch do you think you are with your Hispanic roots? I would say I'm pretty in touch with my Hispanic roots um, as much as I could be being from a household where my dad is more American and my mom is Dominican. I've never visited the Dominican Republic just because we were supposed to and then the pandemic hit. But we would go to Latin concerts and we would play that music in the house, in the car. And it really kept me in touch with, you know, the bachata culture. And, you know, my mom cooks homemade food every single day that I'm home. And that really keeps me in touch with my Hispanic roots because I feel like I can connect so much through music and food. So you would say it's always like a part of your daily life and a part of your culture as a person? Yes, yes, 100%. Hi, my name is Geraldo Montero. While I am a millennial by birth, I consider myself a uh, Gen Z sometimes. I was born in Venezuela. I moved to the U.S. when I was around 12 years old. Geraldo, how in touch do you feel with your family's Venezuelan roots? I feel pretty close to them, right? Like I speak with my parents on a daily basis. That's one of the cultural things I have with them. <laughs> they call me or I call them just to let them know pretty much really anything. And I still keep in touch with a lot of my cousins and aunts over there. So I feel better Venezuelan, I guess. <laughs> my name is Nidia. I'm a Gen X and I live in Pembroke Pines in South Florida. I was born in Dominican Republic and moved to the U.S. when I was 23 years old. I'm Camila's mom. How in touch do you feel you are with your Dominican roots? Oh, uh, I'm really in touch with my root because I have a lot of family in my country still, and we keep in touch really often. And what aspects of your Dominican culture, if any, do you hold on to in preference to mainstream American culture? Oh, uh, the food and the music, especially the music. I cook the food from my country really often so I can introduce Camila and my husband to my culture. I introduce Camila really, really to the music too. So she can have a little bit on my side of my culture. So you, you want to be able to educate both and be able to show them a part of like who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before I was moving to the States, right? You hear a lot of things, how Americans are. And, and one of the main things that caught my attention is like, oh, parents don't really care as much about their kids. Like it's a little more like distant, I guess you could say like, oh, they send their kids off to college at 18 and they just don't talk to them for a while. And that's uh, something that I was kind of shocked to listen to at first. I was like, wow, they don't care, I guess. But I guess like that distancing between their parents and their kids, I think they're not as close as Hispanics typically are. Like Hispanics would hold their kids at their house until they're like in their late 20s if they really wanted to. So even myself, when I moved out of the house at age 21, my mom was like, wow, like very surprised of that. So I would say like how close you are to family. What aspects do you think you keep from your culture? I think the aspects of my culture that I keep would definitely still be the music. I feel like I can still connect with my family through the music that my extended family would listen to when they were growing up. I listened to growing up, for example, we all listen to Mana. Like when their songs come on, we all know all of the lyrics. And although we're a small little family, it does keep us all really close. And it just makes the holidays that much better. And that I would just never give it up. I think there's a lot of things, actually. You know, being in a border city, you have access to so many things from Mexico. So like to this day, I try to find the best tortillas that I can find. I try to, you know, cook beans the way my mom used to make it. Any recipe, really, I try to base it off how my mom does it. And I, I call her up for the recipe and she'll be able to tell me what I need to buy, you know, how to make it, things like that. And just give me the things that I need to get that are more in tune with like Mexican products than American products. Do you consider Spanish or English to be your primary language? Both because we then I have to communicate in English because my husband is really American and we, my parents, when I'm in their house, I have to speak Spanish because they don't speak English. So I consider both primary, you know, I know very basic Spanish. Like I said, I moved over here when I was 12. So my Spanish is pretty middle school level, I would say. I mean, I can speak it, understand and hold a pretty decent conversation with somebody. But, you know, going to college here, having to study for the SATs and ACT, you kind of have to like expand your vocabulary in English. But right now, my primary language is uh, English. Yeah. I consider English to be my primary language just because since my father speaks English and little to no Spanish, that was the number one language we could use for our whole family to communicate. But I still consider myself bilingual. I like to think Spanish is my primary language. Growing up in my household, it was always, you know, Spanish at home, English outside. To this day with my siblings, 
it's like we, we sneak in some English in there sometimes, but I always like based on Spanish and maybe like a little bit of Spanglish, but it's definitely mostly Spanish. When I go see my family, obviously in Mexico, we have to speak Spanish. So it's definitely a bigger part of my culture and my life to speak the Spanish language. Do you primarily watch English language TV shows, Spanish language TV shows or a mixture? I will say about 70% of the entertainment that I watch is in English. I would say because growing up as a teen here and going to college here, that's kind of when you start to develop the things that you like. And living here, I was a little bit more familiar with entertainment in English. But I still watch a lot of media in Spanish as well, like mostly sports, though, because I like the sports casters in Spanish a lot better than in English. So <laughs> it's a mix of both. Because when I watch the Spanish one, is the news. That's the way I can get in touch with my country because sometimes they have news from my country in a Spanish TV. In English, I watch most of my show, they're American shows. So I watch both, but in different news for the Spanish one and then my show and some news from the American one. When you watch Spanish language programs, how do the ads you see on those channels influence the type of brands or products that you buy? That a lot of times has some influence on the things that I pick. For example, like if if I know there's like a business or a brand that it, it was started by somebody who's from Venezuela and they're trying to get it kicked off. Sometimes that resonates with me. And like, yeah, I'll pick that particular brand. Sometimes they're also like more focused on like the demographic, like myself as a Hispanic, let's say, so as a skin product, right? So may not have the same skin tone as somebody else who's born in the United States. So maybe those kinds of things are aimed more towards kind of what I want. So yeah, that does affect sometimes the products that I buy or services. While watching Spanish television programs, do products you see advertised stand out more than those shown in English language shows? I, I believe they do. And I think it's really based on the fact that I do watch mainly English television. So like when my mom is watching Spanish television, it'll be a different type of like situation. The commercials will be in Spanish. So I'll retain them like more, more than an English commercial because it'll be like, it'll be something different in my day. So I definitely, yeah, I think I'll remember a Spanish commercial more than I would an English one. So Camila, thinking about your shopping habits, would you say that your everyday grocery, consumer packed goods and personal care items, you continue to purchase the brands that your parents bought or have you developed your own personal preferences? I think that growing up and then moving away from my house, I've kind of had to form my own personal preferences since I was primarily being my own grocery shopper. Anytime my mom would go grocery shopping and she would bring things back, she would just bring back the tried and true products. And then when I went to college, I would be able to find my way. So I would say it's still half and half because some of the things I buy, I still text my mom and I'm like, hey, do you remember the name or do you have a picture of the thing that you bought me that I really liked? Or if it's something that I kind of don't place that high of a value on, I'll just go ahead and purchase whatever preference I like. I have developed my own preferences because, for example, when I cook the Spanish food, I incorporate the American products to adapt a Spanish recipe. So I have to buy the American because we can find sometimes some of the product that we have in our country. So we have to adapt everything, the recipe with American product. I still buy what my parents buy, especially if I'm making Venezuelan food. Like there's this kind of like flour that we have to make when we make arepas or any other type of things. Like I know I have to pick that specific brand just because I don't trust the other ones. Not because they're bad or anything, but I just know what I'm going to get if I'm going to buy that one. And it applies to other things like vegetables and even stores themselves, not just like the brands. Like if I know that they trust the produce from this particular store, I might go there. Are there any brands from your childhood that you've remained loyal to? Yes. So Depa is the most popular Venezuelan dish, I would say. And harina pan, it's just like this cornmeal, essentially, I think is what it is. And it's like I buy that one brand. It's called Irina Pang, and that's that's the one I picked too. And also Polar is a brand of beverages from Venezuela also. And Malta is a beverage that a lot of Hispanics drink. I only drink Malta from the Polar brand because that's what I grew up on, and that's the flavor that I like. Moving over here to Orlando, it's so difficult to find a good tortilla. So we found one at Walmart from Las Misiones. It's a corn tortilla. That's the closest we could get to a resemblance of what we're used to. So we definitely have stuck with that one if we have not moved away from it. So it's little things like that where if we find something that's close to what we know, we'll definitely stick to it. 
But yeah, there's not that many things. It's just when it's something that's very, very cultural. And how about you? Is there anything that you remember that you kept from your parents' childhood? I don't know the specific brand, but whenever I'm baking something, there's a specific type of vanilla syrup that my mom always used when I was growing up. And it does not taste the same if it is not that syrup. So I will go out of my way to go to Sedanos to yeah. get it, or my mom will go out of her way to Sedanos to yeah. get it. And I have like a bottle in my cupboard up here to always have. And when it comes to shopping for food and drink to be consumed at home, do you tend to shop at stores that serve local Hispanic populations, such as Sedanos, Bravo, or Fresco y Mas? Or do you prefer to shop at Walmart, and Target, or Publix? And whichever one it is, why is that? I definitely try to lean on Walmart, Target, or Publix just because I don't want to have that many stops in my day as a college student. If it's something super important to me, I will go out of my way to go to Sedanos, Bravo, or Fresco y Mas. But when I'm back home, those stores are a lot more accessible to me and my family. And here it's kind of like a 20 minute drive away from my college town. So if I can just get a good alternative at the big brands, I'll do so. But for example, if it's the vanilla, I'll go out of my way to find a Bravo that will have it. There's actually this uh, Hispanic store that I know of. It's called Jalisco here in Orlando. That's where I get like my meat for like doing carne asadas or I, I'm a big believer that the peppers here in Orlando are not as spicy as the ones over there. So when I go there, I can trust that I'm going to have a pepper that's going to be spicy so I can make a good salsa. If it's just chips or, you know, regular household items, I'll definitely just go to like a Walmart, Target, Publix, whatever's closest to me. But if it's something niche that I need that I'm not going to be satisfied with, I would definitely go to that Hispanic market. Are there any food items or products from Mexico that you can't live without? And what do you do if it isn't available from where you normally shop? I cannot have breakfast without tortillas. We're so used to a certain brand. And I even bring some from, from Juarez when I come to visit. So it's like when I run out of those, then I pick up like the one that I can substitute it with. But definitely in my fridge it has to be like a pack of tortillas ready to go for the morning. And how about you? Is there anything that you can't live without that you can think of? Something that I can think of is a soda brand called Country Club from the Dominican Republic, specifically the merengue flavor. It's very hard to find. So I tend to buy it in bulk. So I'll buy like two or three liters at a time. So that way I always have it in my fridge whenever I want it. And if my mom sees it, she'll buy it for me and bring it up for me. And if it normally isn't available where I shop, I'll just probably wait it out and put like an in-stock alert on my phone to be able to have it just because it's a nice thing to have with my meals when I cook at home. I went to high school in Ohio for three years of my life. I lived up there. I was the only Hispanic kid in the school. Well, the only one that spoke fluent Spanish, I would say. And a lot of times when I was there, I know my mom struggled to find some products and we had to get them shipped from the internet, essentially. Because we did try other brands while we were up there, but none of us were <laughs> happy with the outcome, I guess. We'll be right back after these short messages. Hi, I'm Rachel Willis, Account Specialist at Big Eye. Property development and management present their own unique sets of challenges. Growing a powerful, lasting brand takes industry expertise, strategy, and insights. Big Eye's portfolio of property clients reflects our award-winning, extensive experience in all aspects of creative marketing, from multifamily and mixed-use developments, as well as student housing, senior living, and real estate. To see case studies and learn more about Big Eye's award-winning creative and media solutions, perfectly tailored to property development and management, please visit BigEyeProperties.com. Big Eye, reaching the right people in the right place at the right time. Today's shoppers are more informed, connected, and demanding than ever before. A lot of people who never would have thought to order groceries online have seen the light, and I guess they're going to continue to do that. When it comes to influencers' recommendations and the way that you, as a consumer, feel connected to that influencer, it's very similar to getting a recommendation from a family member or a friend. The widespread adoption of online shopping during the pandemic has heightened consumer expectations and challenged retailers to reimagine the customer experience to entice people back to physical stores. It's clear that customer habits have solidified. And to me, that means the digital conversion funnel needs to be working well from top to bottom. And your organization needs to know what levers to pull to convert better step to step. E-commerce is growing exponentially faster on a percentage basis than physical retail. And so it's quite likely that as early as 2033, we may find that 50 or more percent of our consumption is being performed online and or by subscription. Retail disrupted. 
What US shoppers want from brands today? A new report from Big Eye, coming soon. Welcome back. You're listening to a special episode of In Clear Focus, celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. With me, Camila Swanson. And me, Jorge Sedano. A recent report from Pew Research Center finds that a majority of Hispanic consumers in the United States say global climate change and other environmental issues impact their local communities. Eight in every 10, that's 81 percent, say addressing global climate changes is either a top concern or one of several important concerns to them personally, with 39 percent saying it is a top personal concern. By comparison, a lower share of non-Hispanics, 67%, say addressing global climate change is at least one of several important concerns, due in large part to a lower share who say it is a top concern, 29%. How likely are you to purchase a product from a company or brand that you believe is environmentally friendly, even if it costs more than alternative options? For me, it's really important the climate change Because if we don't take care of the environment, we don't want to have a place to live. Yes, I will buy it because if going to take care of the environmental issues, yeah, I don't care how much I pay for. So environmental concern is actually a big concern of mine. Since I was a little kid, my dad was always big into nature and told me how much we need to care about, you know, our planet and our plants and everything else. I grew up in a very nature area, like surrounded by the mountains. So like my dad always like make sure I understood the importance of maintaining our natural habitat like intact and protect it. So it's a very big thing for me. So luckily I'm in a position right now where I can afford to spend some more extra money and like brands that support protecting the environment and using like sustainable materials. So yeah, it, it is a big concern for me. And if I can do my part of it, I will. I would purchase a product from a company that is environmentally friendly, even if it costs more, just because I feel like I can do my part in lessening my carbon footprint and putting in my work to help the environment. The only time I would say that I wouldn't buy something if it was environmentally friendly would be if it was like a huge price gouge type of situation, because I am a college student and I'm on a budget. So it's kind of goes into this either or. But if it's around the same price or not too much more expensive, then I will go ahead and get the environmentally friendly product. So I think I'm pretty likely to get the more environmentally friendly item. I'm not the type of person to really check too much into that. But if I know for a fact that a product is going to be better for the environment, then I think I will pay a little more money to get that product. Who do you think has the most responsibility for adopting more sustainable behaviors? manufacturers and major corporations, or regular people like us who buy the stuff they produce? For me, both. Because if they produce the product, we're going to buy it. But I say before, I will buy it more expensive. If the corporation make the product good for the environment, then I will pay more money. So we can do our part, but I definitely believe manufacturers are the primary responsible for all the pollution that we have on the earth, like water bottle companies, you know, we have like incredible amounts of plastic in the oceans and water bottles are used one time and then they're thrown out and most of them don't even get recycled. So I think manufacturers are the most responsible for the environment and the damage that they do. I think we both have an equal amount, even though corporations create more damage and have more of an impact on the environment. I think individuals make just as big as an impact if we all come together and do the same things. So I think I would say both. A recent report from Edison Research found that 36% of Hispanic adults now listen to podcasts at least monthly, which is 44% increase from 2020, making Hispanic listeners the fastest adopters of podcasts overall. Camila, do you listen to podcasts? I do regularly listen to podcasts. I listen to whatever Spotify will put in my daily drive for when I'm heading over to here from school, just because it changes my routine for my commutes rather than listening to my music. Um, I can listen to a podcast. I think I do at least a couple times a week. Usually it's driving to work or whenever I have some free time where I need something that I don't necessarily want it to be music, but I want to just hear people talk about a certain topic. Yeah, I, I listen to podcasts frequently, I would say every day for the most part. 
especially during work. Now that we're all working from home, it's a nice way to have something in the background and listen to. And do you prefer to listen to podcasts in English or in Spanish? I really don't have a preference. I think I listen to either for what I want, like what I'm looking for. So, for example, I listen to a few comedy podcasts and, for example, one of them, it's in Spanish and I still laugh at it like a lot because it, I feel like the humor is a type of humor that I don't get from a comedian here in the States. So, like, I listen to that one because it kind of like reminds me of like Venezuela a little bit, but it's also like fun to listen to. But if, for example, if I'm looking at a particular topic I'm interested in, like the U.S. stock market, I probably will listen to something uh, in English. I think it's a mix of both. I have certain things that I like to listen in English, like, for example, maybe news or current events that are happening in the U.S. And for Spanish, it's more like comedy and more entertaining things because I think it pertains more to my culture and what I like. And what's your favorite type of podcast? I think my favorite type of podcast is true crime, just because the people who record true crime podcasts tend to find really old case files that are maybe things I haven't heard of or seen before. And I've always loved watching crime TV shows. So it intersects in that way. Definitely comedy and sports are my favorite types of podcasts. My favorite type of podcast is one that wants to tell a story. So to kind of like keep me engaged and listen to like whether it's a personal story or somebody talking about something that they read and their reactions to it and comedy podcast as well. Because I mean, I like to laugh. Is there anything about the portrayal of our cultures on TV or in movies that really annoy you or you feel is consistently inaccurate? I feel annoying because they advertise the Latin country like a third world country instead of advertise as a beautiful country with nice people. The Spanish people, most of us, we are really welcoming people. So I think it's annoying when they think about us like a third world country. A stereotype about Hispanics that I think is overplayed in the media would be when they show any foreign place and they put this yellowing filter over it to show that they're an equivalent to a third world country because I know I've seen pictures of the Dominican Republic from when my mom lived there or when our family goes on vacation and it's the most beautiful, clear skies, clear waters, but in movies, they'll portray it as some war-torn area. There's no culture, there's no vibrancy to it, which I don't believe is true. Yeah, and I definitely agree with that as well. I think there's that movie Sicario where they transfer from the U.S. to Mexico and you can tell just the difference in like the way they portray it and the filter that they use, like she said. And yeah, I think there's just a lot of things in the movie scene where they may not get it like we would want them to get it. So maybe one day we'll be a little, a little more accurate. What sometimes tends to happen is that they try to like put us all into one group of people. I don't think they do a good job at separating where they're from. Let's say there's a Hispanic kid on the soccer team and everybody just kind of assumes they're all from like the same country. I feel like they could be a little bit more like, hey, no, he's actually from Venezuela. Oh, this guy's actually from Colombia. He's actually from Argentina. Like sometimes I feel like they're just put us all into one bucket rather than like explaining how we're all different. Like, yes, we all come from like the same continent, but it's like putting, I guess, Americans and Canadians in the same bucket. But no, you'd never see that. You always see like the separation. Oh, he's Canadian. Oh, he's American. So I feel like for Hispanics, we tend to get put in the same bucket. Thanks to all our friends who contributed to this week's podcast. Thank you so much, Emma, for being such a great co-host. And thank you, Jorge, for being such a great co-host. You'll find a transcript on the In Clear Focus page at BigEyeAgency.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider following us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, YouTube, or wherever you get your daily fix of podcasts. Thank you for listening to In Clear Focus, produced by Big Eye. We've been your hosts, Camila Swanson and Jorge Sedano. Until next week. Adios. <laughs>